NATO warns Russia's war in Ukraine could last years. Both sides say negotiations have broken down. Can the conflict be ended through diplomacy? And if so, under what conditions? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Fully Batibo. It's now nearly four months since Russia invaded Ukraine. Casualties are mounting on both sides. Russia is intensifying its offensive to seize strategic towns in eastern Ukraine. The head of NATO and Britain's prime minister warn the conflict could last years. Both have urged Western governments to keep sending military support to Ukraine to halt Russian advances. Diplomatic negotiations appear to have stalled. Ukrainian and Russian delegates last held face-to-face -face talks in Istanbul in March. They've since held meetings by video link, but Ukraine's president says they've made little progress. Such negotiations are currently at zero. Everyone really wants to push us little by little towards some result that is definitely undesirable for us, because we have not yet been asked, but beneficial for other parties that have their own interests. Fatigue is growing. People want some kind of result for themselves, and we need a result. Now, Russia says the talks have reached a dead end. The Kremlin has accused Ukraine of being inconsistent with its demands. Here's what President Vladimir Putin said in April, the last time he addressed the negotiations directly. The Ukrainian the Ukrainian side move away from its agreement in Istanbul. Now the requirements for security guarantees is one thing, and the settlement of relations with Crimea, Sevastopol and the Donbass are to be taken outside of those agreements. So we are back in a dead-end situation. While negotiations between Moscow and Kyiv began four days after Russia invaded, low-level delegations from both sides first met on Ukraine's border with Belarus. They came together again in March for a second and third round where they agreed to form some humanitarian corridors. The first high-level contact took place in Turkey during intense fighting and bombardment in the Ukrainian port city of Mariupol. Two hours of talks achieved no breakthroughs. Russia continued bombing. On April the 7th, both sides announced talks were entering a new phase, but despite many rounds since, no solid ceasefire has been agreed. Let's now bring in our guests in Lviv, Dimitro Sholga, European Program Director at the International Renaissance Foundation. In Brussels, Teresa Fallon, Director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. And in Moscow, Pavel Felgenhauer, a defense and military analyst. Welcome to you all. Thank you for being with us on Inside Story. Dimitro, in Ukraine, if I can start with you, there were hopeful signs in early May, but then negotiations ground to a halt with each side accusing each other uh, for the collapse. Are the conditions on the ground today and the factors, are they favorable to a resumption of uh, diplomacy, in your opinion? I think now... Uh... The fate is being decided in the battle, in the battle of Don, for Donbass, for the east of Ukraine. Uh, position of the two sides are totally, totally controversial, totally different. Uh, for Russia, it is aggressive war, a war of conquest, uh, and they basically now openly say, the Russian officials openly say that their goal is to seize Ukrainian land and to change Ukraine's borders uh, and to dismantle Ukraine's sovereignty as a whole. Uh, for Ukraine, of, of course, it's self-defense. So mm -hmm. absolutely, there is kind of little ground for compromise here. Right. So for Ukraine, it's a totally different goal to repel the attackers uh, to the previously uh, contact line, at least uh, held on uh, 23rd of February. So I think now it will be uh, decided in the battle until there is some uh, developments there. Uh, we will not see, I think, uh, mm -hmm. any resumption of meaningful resumption of meaningful negotiations. Dimitro, in what frame of mind are the Ukrainians right now? The Russians have been progressing in the East, even, you know, if, if slowly. Do the Ukrainians still believe that they can uh, win, that with more Western powers and ammunition, that they can turn the tide? Yes, yes, sure. I mean, Ukrainian resolve is, is, the, is here, is there. 
and uh, Ukraine is fighting, and uh, the mood is uh, absolutely resolu uh, resolutive that we need to fight, we need to defend our land. Uh, of course, there was expectation probably that it will take less time, it will be like uh, not this uh, long uh, war of attrition, but it by kind of all signs are there that it will take longer than expected. Mm. I think expected by everyone, including by Russians as well. Okay, let's get the view from Russia with Pavel. What's the mood like in Moscow, Pavel? Is there any appetite in Moscow to return to the negotiating table? Well, the official Russian position is that Russia is ready to talk, uh, but the Ukrainians do not want to, and they, don't, they know the Russian uh, position. They know what they should accept. They are not ready to accept, and that means, well, it's all going to be uh, both sides agree to disagree, agree to uh, log it out on the battlefield the good old way. And, uh, of course, yes, the positions of the two sides have been miles apart, or well, they will be have been miles apart from basically the very beginning. Uh, um, Moscow, in Moscow, actually, the war is not felt at all. It's a very kind of peaceful city. Um, the general public kind of mostly tends to make act as if there is no war or this is a far some happening somewhere in the far off land. There's reports, of course, about officials official about the war happening mm -hmm. about Russia, the success of Russian and so-called allied troops from the Donbas small republics, um, battering the Ukrainians, uh, kind of grinding them uh, into pulp. And that this is going to the Russian operation is going to end in success, but no one knows when. Right. And this is basically more or less accepted by the Russian. But what about people, the sanctions? The but what about the sanctions, Pavel? The sanctions and the fact that Russia is isolated is not not, not resonating with people. Uh, yes, of course, that's well known that Russia is uh, actually isolated, though, of course, again, the official line is that uh, Arab nations, um, and, uh, China, India, uh, Latin America, Africa are, are more or less friendly. It's the West that is against us. Uh, but this uh, kind of has um, actually helped uh, the authorities to rally mm. the, um, a large portion of the public around uh, the Kremlin. Uh, that we are surrounded by, are attacked by uh, very powerful enemies, and we should act together and support uh, the, the effort of the, uh, the Kremlin and the president, and that everything is going to be okay. Okay, let's bring Teresa into the conversation now. Teresa, warring sides come to talks when there's a stalemate in a conflict or when one side has won. Do you feel that we are at a point in this war in Ukraine where both sides could be ready to talk again? It seems that that's a bit premature at this point. I think that uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky has made it quite clear that he wouldn't be able to give up territory, although he has said that he wants to continue dialogue and negotiations with Russia. The, the war has turned on such... Um, so there have been so many deaths on both sides. Mm -hmm. The idea of negotiations before were kind of you have to give up some territory to, to Russia. So I think that this was one of the, the deal breakers. And I think that... Uh, as long as this continues on, as it grinds on, as we've heard uh, the head of NATO, uh, Jen Stoltenberg from NATO, mm. uh, the analysis is that this will grind on for quite a long time. The key question now is, will Europe be able to remain unified? Mm -hmm. Because we see increasing inflation, high energy prices, and energy and food are are deeply connected. So when you have high energy prices, you will also have high food prices in addition to the blockade of uh food leaving uh, Ukraine that's being stopped. So we're seeing a huge issue. Maybe Russia thinks that they can play this for what it's worth and see Europe divided. Right. Nevertheless, we saw France, Italy, and Germany go to Kiev by train, and they have announced that uh, Ukraine will be a candidate country for mm -hmm. EU membership. Now, how long that will take remains to be seen, but that's kind of a vote of confidence and right. support uh, for Ukraine. Indeed, NATO Secretary General Theresa has said that uh, you know Ukraine will require long-term military support. And indeed, the Ukrainians are pretty much dependent on, on decision and support from Washington, Paris, the European Union. Do you get a sense that this support is now waning as the war drags on and that it could there could be some let up in, in supporting uh, Ukraine because of these divisions that you spoke about within European countries. 
I know Ukraine is worried about fatigue, mm -hmm. perhaps in Europe, but we see that the U.S. is the biggest supplier right now of equipment and material. So Germany has been dragging their feet. They've been making promises and not delivering, and this is a worrisome message. Also, France under Macron has sent uh, mixed messages about uh, Ukraine, saying that we cannot uh, humiliate Russia. So mm -hmm. this really went down poorly in Europe. Nevertheless, France has been sending some weaponry. It's kind of not reported so loudly. But I think that there is a real division growing uh, in Europe, we see the Central Eastern European member states who have a lot more empathy uh, for and support for Ukraine because of their past history. And we see other countries trying to make calculations uh, in regard to energy right. and inflation. And they have to get reelected. So I think Putin has played a very dangerous game here because now his biggest a client, which is Europe. He earns 250 to 300 billion a year in energy payments from Europe. He has now decided to recklessly put that on the line in order by turning off the tap to many countries in Europe. They are never going to go back to such high dependency on Russian energy. Mm -hmm. And other countries like China will not pick up the slack. They might pick up a little bit of it, but China is very clever about diversifying. They will not allow Russia to do the same thing to them that they're doing to Europe. So I think that Putin has really put himself uh, in, a, in a corner and he's, it's in my view, almost total war. He doesn't right. care anymore. If he loses these markets. Dimitro, uh, Teresa alluded to the conditions, some of the conditions and the non-negotiating position of Ukraine when it comes, for example, to its territorial integrity. But do you think there could be some movement on some of these red lines if this war drags on and Ukraine has to, to give up something? What would they be willing to give up? I don't know, really. I mean, uh, territorial integrity is really non-negotiable, uh, for sure. And uh, whatever future peace agreement uh, there could be, uh, we have already had experience of having agreements with Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, including, for instance, the uh, so-called Minsk agreements brokered by Germany and France uh, in 2014-2015. And uh, we've seen that basically Russia did, uh, wh how it basically used those, those agreements. Uh, those agreements uh, basically provided uh, some uh, uh, form of uh, settlement in the way that uh, Ukraine would give some uh, self-governance uh, provisions for those uh, uh, lands occupied by Russia this, at that time in the east of Ukraine. And uh, while Russia will uh, withdraw its forces from, from there, but Russia never withdrew its forces from there, actually, they used all the opportunity to de facto occupy, de facto annex that, those territories. And now they use those territories to further attack Ukraine and actually to also use even manpower uh, uh, mobilized from, from those territories actually now serving for the Russian army mm. and basically used as a cannon flash for, for the Russian army to attack Ukrainian forces. Right. So from that perspective, uh, from this experience, we understand that we never can uh, accept any sort of deal uh, implying uh, refusing from parts of Ukrainian lands. Right. What what other things can be there? Uh, where what could be negotiated? I mean, I don't know. Maybe there might be some negotiations about security arrangements, uh, particular things about I don't know uh, some uh, security uh, confidence building measures and so on. But mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's kind of now speculation because we really don't know the parameters, the key parameters of, uh, of the future right. diplomatic resolution of the conflict, because it is uh, really depends on the key security thing, which is where the front line will be there, uh, what what uh, what conditions will be, what, what okay. will, who basically, who will win, will, will win this war. L let me bring in um, um, Pavel uh, to talk about this. What Pavel could be the negotiation negotiated rather as far as Russia is concerned. In previous negotiations, Russia um, insisted about maintaining uh, control over large parts of Ukraine. Is that still the case today? What would they be willing to negotiate at this point? Uh, well, apparently, Moscow uh, demand key demand is that uh, any kind of government, a future government in Kiev, will recognize Crimea as sovereign Russian territory. 
uh, and also, so that sanctions can be removed, and also recognize the independence of these uh, small uh, Donbas republics uh, that Russia has uh, already recognized. And then uh, maybe there could be some kind of negotiations about other territories in uh, Zaporozhsk Oblast and uh, uh, Kherson Oblast that uh, Russia has since occupied that maybe also could go somewhere, but maybe that's negotiable. Hmm. I don't know. Uh, but it's understood also that Ukraine and the government right now is not ready to talk, take those conditions. Uh, so that the Russia right now, the Russian strategy is to grind the Ukrainian military, grind their morale. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the, the pitched battle in the Donbass right now. It's very similar to the, Verde, as the, sea, the, the storming of, and siege of Verden by the Germans in 1916, when they didn't have enough forces to get, have an no, all-out offensive on the Western Front. They concentrated on one fortress. Uh, they were then uh, using their uh, firepower superiority to kill as much French as possible and break the morale of the French army. And right now, Russia is trying to do more or less the same, of course, on a very different uh, level of usage of power and men. Uh, but uh, they're, they're, apparently, Ukrainians are suffering their military heavy casualties. Mm -hmm. That could affect morale. And if Ukrainian morale begins to snap, then most likely Ukraine would be ready to take the Russian conditions. Okay, Teresa, right now we are at a point where neither side uh, wants to give up anything. So what is, is it going to take, in your view, to end the stalemate? I think we also have to zoom back a bit on the bigger geopolitical questions here. Mm -hmm. We see the UN Security Council, two members of them, of the Security Council supporting this war. So it's a question of sovereignty. We know that Beijing is watching what happens here very, very closely, and they're making their own calculus in regard to Taiwan. So these issues of sovereignty, I think, are key. Will the Europeans just sit back like they did in 2014 after Crimea? This is a much bigger issue. So right. I think... But there are those who say, well, ask whether European support for Ukraine, long-time European support for Ukraine, is justified. Well, as I mentioned, there are some divisions within Europe on that. Mm -hmm. There will be a meeting this coming week of the EU Council, which they will discuss this further. On the American side, it's quite interesting because I understand that there is less discussion between Moscow and Washington, D.C. than there was at the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis. And I think that's a worrying message right there. And the back channel reportedly is... Dr. Henry Kissinger, who is actually 99 years old. So he had counseled that Ukraine give up some territory. So I think that that didn't fly very well. Right. And I think that over the longer term, uh, many analysts in, in Washington, D.C. are concerned that the U.S. is taking the eye off the ball in regard to China. They're worried about getting bogged down in a very, very long, drawn-out affair here mm -hmm. in Ukraine. Alternatively, some see it as a way to weaken Russia over the longer term. Right. So there are very different viewpoints on this. Indeed. And Russia is becoming more and more isolated and their economy is really going to suffer. Teresa, some experts have suggested that we could end up uh, with a scenario like the one on the Korean Peninsula, where Ukraine is divided into two parts without a formal treaty and that such a division would allow the Western allied part of Ukraine to prosper in the same way that South Korea has. Do, do you see this at all? Well, my personal opinion would be that that would send a, a rather negative message. Uh, Russia def definitely wants this kind of buffer zone, but the Ukrainians have made such a huge sacrifice uh, in blood, sweat and tears, to paraphrase Churchill, would that be really the right thing to do? At this stage, I think it's too early to tell how the negotiations will take place. Mm -hmm. I think that it's untenable for Zelensky to give up any territory. That is an interesting uh, idea. Mm -hmm. But as we see that there's a great deal of instability on the Korean peninsula with North Korea and nuclear weapons. And let's remember that Ukraine gave up their nuclear weapons and that all these countries under the Budapest Memorandum uh, pledged to support them and guarantee their sovereignty. And that really hasn't held water. So that sends also a dangerous message to Iran and North Korea. All right, Dimitri, your thoughts about this, some of the possible scenarios that have been put out there, like, you know, uh, Ukraine ending up uh, in a situation like uh, the one on the Korean peninsula. 
and, and you know, where do you see things heading? And what would be the minimum acceptable agreement for Ukraine? Well, this Korean formula might be one of the scenarios, of course, but uh, just let's not forget first that uh, with uh, uh, with the, I mean, unlike in the Korean case, we don't have really uh, two Koreas or two Ukraines fighting each other. We have basically Ukrainian army and the Russian army. So if we will have a sort of a ceasefire agreement with the contact line, there, uh, then it will be not uh, between some Ukraine and another and another one Ukraine, but it will be between Ukraine and Russian forces, and uh, it, it, it's a key difference. One and second is the question: well, how to implement the ceasefire? Uh, I mean, it's uh, also a big question because we again we have uh, our own experience of uh, of the Minsk agreements since 2014-15 where ceasefire was number one of uh, of those agreements, uh, number one issue, but it was never implemented in full. So it was always uh, violated almost every day right. uh, by Russians. Uh, and uh, that's uh, kind of, that's uh, that, that's a question how, how it can be enforced uh, if it is enforced by international uh, I don't know peacekeeping forces. Whether whether there are, whether, whether there is any international peacekeeping force ready to come to enforce such a ceasefire. So it's very complicated issue, I think. Yeah. Uh, so probably it's uh, it might be one of the scenarios. Right. But, uh, just Pavel, so your just thoughts. I mean, your thoughts. There are various scenarios out there about how this could end. Do you think this could end through diplomacy? And if so, how and when? Well, of course, it will end um, uh, somehow uh, through diplomacy, but before that, there's going to be a lot of fighting and a lot of bloodshed. Uh, the summer campaign has just basically begun, and, and it will last maybe at least till this uh, mid-September, uh, maybe till October, when the autumn rains turn the soil into a lot of sea of dirt, the Rasputitsa, and the fighting is going to, well, if not end, it's going to at least uh, become more, uh, positions will be more stable. And it's clear that the Ukrainians hope that in August, September, they could turn the tables and have a strategic initiative and maybe go against the Russians in an offensive. The Russians believe that they have the capability to grind down the Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. So that will be decided actually on the battlefield, who has the initiative, who has uh, the upper hand. And then that will be translated somehow into a negotiating right. that a settlement may be by New Year, maybe in next year. All right, Teresa, I'll give you the last word. Once we get to a point where the war is settled or resolved, what will be the future relationship of all these countries that have supported Ukraine with Russia? Well, it's been a very intricate tapestry of interests. And I think that Europe, especially Poland, has really risen to this challenge. They have been such a huge advocate for Ukraine. So the fact that Ukraine will be a candidate country, will help give them the goal of reform and give the people some hope and mor morale boost. Uh, it remains to be seen if they will join the EU, but this actually provides them a roadmap to the future. Uh, politically, I wonder if that will really happen, but I do hope that this will help them to uh, reform and prevent corruption. But also we have to see that, as Pavel mentioned, he, he gave the example of going back to World War One. The peace in Europe is over. We can't take any of these things for granted any longer. And we see the authoritarian march of both uh, Russia and China. And these are huge questions for us. And they're perhaps a dress rehearsal for what we're going to see in, in Asia. So I think that uh, Europe has to stay united and strong and it's and bunker down for the long haul. And in regards to energy prices and the winter that's going to be coming, we see that uh, Moscow has cut off uh, energy. And that's mm -hmm. the traditional period in the summer is to fill up the uh, storage facility. So right. I suggest everybody start getting some sweaters. So thank you. Okay. Thank you all very much for a very interesting discussion. Dimitro Shulga, Teresa Fallon and Pavel Felgenhauer.
And thank you for watching. You can watch this program again anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can, of course, also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Fuli Batibo, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. Bye for now.